So first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. Uh, this is our first ever Mercent uh, client reception and open house. Let me just start by saying thank you to our current customers who are here. Uh, we have some very uh, targeted content that I hope you find useful tonight, as well as some information that are, uh, reflects our observations on the broader e-commerce market, uh, what we see happening with some of our key partners, uh, Amazon here in town, Google, uh, as well as some broader observations on the retail economy overall as we head into the final uh, stages of holiday 2012. Wall Street Journal came out a few weeks ago and they, um, uh, they stated that enterprise software was sexy again. <laughs> so that's the theme of, no, that's actually not the theme of tonight. <laughs> it's a good place to start. Um, why don't we jump right in? So I think most of you are familiar at this point with Mercent, but just as a quick reminder, uh, we've dedicated our lives to making our retail customers more visible, more competitive, and more profitable uh, across digital advertising channels. And um, the scope of that mission and vision as a business is expanding every day, both in terms of advertising distribution, um, as well as the, way that, the ways that we use data for our clients. We serve a portfolio today of more than 500 uh, unique retail brands, and uh, many of those are here in the Pacific Northwest. So again, thanks uh, to those of you. Uh, I think we've got some familiar names here from, from the regional market on the slide, uh, as well as many others across the nation, um, Office Depot, Home Depot, Home Shopping Network, and many others that, that we uh, count within our portfolio. At the root of our business is our software as a service platform. It's Mercent Retail, uh, and it basically lives between your e-commerce storefront uh, and warehouse, and again, this broadening network of advertising and merchandising channels. As I mentioned earlier, the scope of our business is expanding. We started out with a very simple value proposition, which is that it was cheaper and faster uh, to express your product catalog and merchandising offers across the web if you work with Mercent as an intermediary. Now, what we found over time is that as we've moved into more strategic value proposition for our retail clients, and we're working on advertising optimization, uh, that there are diminishing returns to the optimization of an ad on the web. And what I mean by that is, at some point, uh, no matter how much advertising spend you allocate, uh, or how smart your platform is or your people are, uh, consumers realize that what matters is the strength of your offer. Your price, your reputation online, um, the speed at which you can fulfill a product. And so we've seen our business move uh, back into the operational line of business infrastructure of our customers over time. Um, and most notably, when you look at the different data sets that we manage for our customers and for our partner ecosystem, um, increasingly we're, we're concerned with that very question. What is the optimal price and merchandising offer that I should be promoting to this consumer at this moment in time, on this channel, reflective of all of the market signals that are available to me as a merchant? Uh, and this has manifested, uh, recently we've come out and publicly stated that we're uh, dynamically pricing our clients' products at the rate of 2 million product SKUs per hour. Um, and I'd like to think that Mercent uh, is helping to accelerate the rate at which the retail industry is um, reaching consumers with a unique, timely, relevant uh, offer. And so just final uh, opening comments here, and then we'll get into some uh, specific metrics around Amazon and Google. Uh, and transparent pricing across the industry. I just want to uh, talk a little bit about the influence of Amazon and Google combined, uh, not just on the e-commerce market, but on retail overall. Uh, I think if you're familiar with Amazon, either as an employee or as a third-party seller, you know that, uh, as I've mentioned, your offer uh, equals relevancy on that channel, and that it's almost a binary uh, exercise. You're either winning the buy box, you're in that preeminent position on the product detail page, or you're not. Uh, and and uh, the winner takes all in that environment. Uh, 
Amazon and Google combined, and, and of course Google is moving more and more into a model that we believe um, is Amazon-like. It's focused on a very stated, strategic uh, move into uh, the operation of their business as an e-commerce and, more broadly speaking, local retail platform. But today, when you look at all e-commerce purchases uh, online, 43% of purchases may not end at Amazon or Google, but, but they begin at one of those two locations on the web. And so the implications of that for offline retail become uh, profound when you realize that more than half of all offline purchases uh, are researched in advance on a smartphone or a tablet or through a web browser. Um, and the results of this in terms of Amazon's real influence uh, on e-commerce and retail is that <clears throat> online, these channels are initi initiating $100 billion in total sales, but offline, they are directly influencing uh, more than a half trillion dollars in domestic uh, consumer shopping. Uh, and that's 20% of the total U.S. economy. And when we look at the aggregate growth of these channels for our retail customers, we're looking at 50% year-over-year growth, which of course is faster than retail, but it's also uh, two to three times faster than the organic e-commerce growth rate. So that sets the stage for uh, some information that uh, Frank Koshinesh, who is our VP of Products and Services, uh, will make about first Google and then Amazon. Great. Frank? Yeah, thanks, Eric. And thank you all for coming today. Is that too loud or not loud enough? Yeah, Can you hear me back, way back there? All right. Uh, so thanks again. With such a diverse audience here today of retailers, marketing agencies and companies, and technology companies, as well as some friends from the press, our not-so-hidden objective is to facilitate communication and discussion and knowledge sharing between, between everyone. So we wanted to talk about what are some key trends that are happening in retail and e-commerce, and what are implications, and then open it, you know, have questions that ensue formally, but as well as informally over the bar. So there's trends, we could go on for, for hours on trends that are happening in e-commerce, and my team, unfortunately, has probably heard me go on for near hours on some of the trends. So we're kind of nailing it, trying to summarize it down to three that we think will help achieve that goal of facilitating discussion and constructive Q&A. And the first of those is simply this, that Google is an e-commerce destination. Now, hopefully that's, you're kind of wondering, not, what are you talking about, Frank? Frank, Google is a search engine. That's where you go to search, you put in keywords, and it, it tells you what's there. And you might say, well, well, they're also a social networking site, and they make mobile phones, and they have a map application, and they have a couple other things. They have a, you know, a video site. But they're an e-commerce destination. And while we're very familiar with paid search marketing, which serves the text ad when someone searches for Red Denali jacket, and most in this room, I think, are pretty familiar with the picture ads, what we call product listing ads, when you type Red Denali jacket, that show up on the search engine results page. Occurring in lockstep with that change in experience is really an e-commerce commitment and a retail commitment by Google. And what that looks like is, is something like this. Now, this is the, the Google Shopping tab. And on the search engine results page for Red Denali Jacket, you would see like this jacket as a picture ad, a product listing ad, as well as your paid search text ads. But in lockstep with that is this experience. And what's happening here is, and you look at that and you see there's a picture in the upper left hand corner, there's description, there's feature points, there's people who also looked at this, also looked. There's this red, I mean, sorry, a blue box up there that looks like it would be an add to cart box. It's not an add to cart box, but it's an add to your shopping list. Uh, if you hit Rock Creek, that takes you off to the Rock Creek site. It's worth noting, too, we, we had to look long and hard for a uh, merchant that's selling the Denali North Face, uh, North Face Denali jacket that's not a Mercant client. Yeah. We didn't want to offend anybody, but uh, so I had to dig pretty far down into Rock Creek, but they're on our list, so if anyone for Rock, Rock Creek. But the, the point is that this is, this is more what looks like an e-commerce experience. Now, this is on the shopping tab, but it's evolving in concert with that product, that picture ad, right, you know, product listing ad that's occurring. 
And this has been a major shift over the last two years recently. Uh, and I want to share a little bit of the data about what's, what's going on. So as a brief primer, uh, going back to uh, September, uh, tw uh, January of 2011, that's when Google had, took their, their free program of, of Google product search, which is kind of the picture ad, but they were free, and augmented them with a pay-for-placement program called product listing ads. This year, they announced effectively that Google Shopping is a new program, and it's all paid for placement, where a bid makes an effect. What this graph is showing is for a set of clients, uh, and we have 50, this includes 51 clients that over a long term have been uh, operating and live on both the free program, which is the red line, and the paid program, product listing ads, which is the blue line, since April for over 15 months. And we're tracking daily traffic from these two programs. So this is April 1st. The first blue line here is May 31st, when Google announced that this program shift would occur. The yellow line is June 28th, when Google essentially made the main search engine results page pay for placement for these product listing ads, these picture ads. And then the, the blue, rock, blue line to the right is July 23rd, when Google started to increase the incidence of pay for placement in the shopping tab. So this is a, right after this period, it's a very big drop, and that's not to be surprised, it's not surprising, because about 70% of the traffic from those picture ads, those product listing ads, comes from the main search result page. So when that shifted, there was a big drop in the free traffic. After July 23rd, it pretty much uh, continued on, and it's been, you know, at this kind of life support level for a long time. And in fact, it's supposed to be um, de fully deprecated as of October 17th, but we're still seeing some residual um, free traffic coming in. The other thing to note is that the paid traffic has in increasing consistently through this time, and if you would actually compare these bars, it is now more than made up for the combination of the lost free traffic. So what that is saying is that retailers have embraced it and have found return justified volume in this program and are getting the traffic. If you want to look at... Not seasonal. No, this is not seasonal. There's certainly some seasonality that comes into to effect here. But if it were seasonal, we would see this in both graphs, the free and the paid. And um, we don't, like, if there's a lot of seasonality that we find in our business across our client base that really starts to kick in really about, about now or about a week from now. So we don't believe that this is, is, is seasonality. If we look at uh, CPCs, this is for the same time period, the same clients, what's happened to cost per click? So... Part of the industry is like, well, Google's doing this. Google has good reasons for doing this, to improve the shopping experience, to make the data better, to please their consumers. Um, they have shareholders, too. So what's the price for this? We've seen pretty consistent CPCs for the Google Shopping Program, the Product Listing App Program. Um, if you draw a line through that for most of this time period, it would slope, it would slope slightly upward. Um, in the past month, there were some interesting effects uh, that occurred, um, but it also leveled out. This is about 40 cents, um, so about 48 cents. So there's been a trend, but a modest trend of increasing CPCs. And that's somewhat to be expected uh, as we get closer to the holiday season. So this is a case where increased competition could be uh, happening, but it's, it's probably due to increased competition. The free program is fully deprecated as of, they like said, October 17th. So more retailers are into the auction that drives up CPCs. And I think the last thing we have here, and this is one of the most interesting charts, but it, 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 le it, it leads to how important this Google Shopping program is and how, I think, how important I think this initiative by Google is as it relates to e-commerce and retail. So there's, there's two lines here. There's, the blue is sales from this Google Shopping program, the paid part of it, PLA, divided by total sales from product listing ads and text ads, paid search text ads. The red is simply the ratio of the two. How much sales came from your shopping program, which is the paid picture ads, for those that aren't familiar, divided by 
your, how much sales came from your text ads, the, the more conventional paid search text ads. For most, and this starts in January 2011, for most of 2011, what we saw and what we heard from clients is that this is a, this is a performing program, but I can't get the volume. I want to do more. I don't know what I'm serving and whatnot. Last Q4, I think Google made some adjustments, and the volume unleashed the volume. So we saw like a peak daily rate and probably an average of around 20% of your paid, of a retailer's paid search sales came from this shopping program. That kind of dipped after the, after the holiday and started to increase. And these are those same three milestones. So once the free program started to uh, be phased out, this shopping program is now a substantially important part of, uh, of a retailer's presence on Google, or it could be. This would suggest, I mean, this suggests that about, you know, in the 30 to 40 percent range of a retailer's sales from Google will come from this shopping, this e-commerce-like program, um, as the, you know, the, the, the remainder being from the paid search text ads. Uh, so this is important. And the, the last thing here is, you know, this is, this is all, I mean, from what we think, you know, this is a very real uh, commitment on Google's part, that this is not just shopping and these, these paid, uh, you know, the, the picture ads. I think they, they mean business uh, about retail and uh, e-commerce and improving the customer experience, data quality, and for retailers. So we talked about Google Shopping, Google Trusted Stores is where they're trying to give the user, the consumer signals on how good a store is, will they fulfill it, how good is their customer service. Uh, Google Retail Promotions uh, is in a, a limited beta now that we support. This is attaching promotions to your Google offers and to your Google shopping listings. Circulars is the digitized circular that you know, typically you'd see in your Sunday paper. Catalogs, local, wallet, the rumors around same day delivery. All these, I think, are creating an e-commerce and a retail experience. Some are more connected than others, but I think, in, in you know, in our view, my view, that there's, you know, Google is trying to make, is, is making important and valuable and significant changes in not just e-commerce, but retail. By the so, way, the, the red and blue color choices here was not some political subtext or secret. Uh, <laughs> certainly not. Commentary on any recent... Yeah. So, it's related to our brand. Yeah, I'm trying to stay, you know, haze gray. Anyway. Uh, so what's the context for this? Well, that leads to number two, which is Amazon's a search engine. I think to understand what's happening at Google, you've got to understand what's happening at Amazon. Amazon is many things, too, just like Google is. Amazon is a search engine, really, but they're an e-commerce site. Amazon's a retailer. They sell the Denali jacket themselves. They house it in their warehouse. They also make consumer electronic devices called you know, e-book readers. Um, but they're a search engine. Um, uh, Forrester came out with uh, this, this uh, study in July that lent some third-party data that we think is very important that uh, kind of portrays what we experience uh, for a while, which is 30% of uh, consumers research, that look for products research on Amazon first, 13% research on, on Google first. You know, this is in no way to say that Google isn't important, but uh, this data was saying that uh, like 10 years ago, this was not the picture. So there's, there's data, so that's 43% of, of uh, shopping research is influenced by those two sites alone. So it's kind of like a competition going on here, uh, which, is, which is good. Some other data points that came out of this that kind of lead to the scale that's involved here is, is in uh, between 2001-2011, Amazon went from 9% of U.S. e-commerce sales to 19%. That's amazing. One out of five dollars bought online is bought on Amazon once you include the value of third-party sales. And they're still growing domestically in the U.S. by 20% plus. Um, the third-party sales is in excess of 40%. So there's something here that has worked from Amazon because you know it's people aren't just going there to buy stuff. And the kind of point and realization here is it's a search engine, it's a publisher, it's like the Wikipedia of products. 
So Amazon is placing ads that they call Amazon product ads, which look very similar and behave very similar, and we manage them very similarly to Google Shopping, Google product listing ads. So some comparison of what is happening here and how these two, as well as other competitors in the industry, are, are happening, kind of trying to broadly just break down what's Amazon doing and their keys to success as a retailer and as a marketplace search engine publisher. So broad assortment and value-based and value pricing on the retailer side, as a marketplace, as a search engine, as a publisher, having an authoritative product catalog that has data that they trust, it's like the Wikipedia of products, being a trusted fulfillment source and great customer service, um, and having a great user experience. And if you look at some of the other you know, Google and eBay comparison shopping sites like uh, Shopzilla, as well as big box retailers, they're challenged in, in some of those ways, and I think they're trying to make it better. I, you know, I do think that like authoritative product catalog, for example, part, I think Google is being very genuine when they say part of the objective for Google Shopping is to improve the quality of their data so that they can improve the customer experience for their users. Well, you kind of realize that it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the best thing to throw or put everything to the site uh, to they get. Having some curation of that product data, like Amazon has provided, provides value. eBay, I think, is learning a similar lesson. So I think there's some best practices learning that's occurring between these two. And this is why I kind of think that you can better understand what's happening on Google when you understand what's happening on Amazon, and vice versa, by the way. Uh, so I think with what Amazon's doing on their product ads, their CPC advertising platform, and expanding that, we can, you know, I, I think there's, there's lessons there that we could learn, that they're learning from Google. Um, and lastly, you know, I think we have on here, like, what the growth is um, on this. So this is kind of, you know, got to provide some data. What's same store sales for our Amazon third-party business? This is clients on Amazon at least 15 months. Um, you know, pretty consistently in the 30 to 40% range. Um, and that's, you know, e-commerce in general is around 15%, retail 2, 4, 3%. These are pretty impressive numbers year over year, and if you drag them back, uh, it's still the same or higher. And while that's maybe some slight moderation, it's still very powerful growth. And these are large retailers that have been on the channel for a while. Frank, I know this is your last slide, but I just wanted to comment. One interesting thing that we saw is we saw a dramatic drop-off on Amazon year over year uh, growth during the holiday last year. Our clients underestimated their inventory uh, planning requirements for the Amazon channel and literally ran out of stock on their top selling products well before uh, they hit their peak uh, selling days and weeks. Um, and so we saw this really interesting front-loaded holiday season um, and it just speaks to the, you know, the impact of the channel and also the importance of proper retail planning as you're thinking about Amazon as a channel. And so the last, uh, I have one, you know, one slide left is another, so a key thing to, we've learned about the Amazon experience and likely a lot of the, all the retailers here have, is that owning the buy box, and for those not familiar, that's the buy box, these are the featured, other featured merchants, is what drives 90 plus X per sales for any competing product. So as Eric was talking about technology, speaking from a roadmap, being able to create the best offer, which is the combination of the product, the price, the shipping price, the service, and the store rating. If you get yourself into that buy box on Amazon, that's how you drive the sales. And this leads to the third and last trend that Eric's going to touch on, which occurs when this type of experience in that buy box starts to happen on a mobile phone. Okay, thanks, Frank. I see a lot of empty glasses, and there's a board, uh, very bored bartender in our lobby, so we're, I'm going to go fast. <laughs> so, you know, maybe this is the crux of, of what we've been talking about, is that um, as Amazon and Google and uh, smartphones and tablets go, uh, so goes the retail industry and ultimately the retail economy. And so um, we are in the business of setting prices um, in, in a, uh, an increasingly uh, large footprint of uh, retail channels. 
We launched our first version of dynamic pricing for Amazon uh, two years ago, uh, and we've been iterating on that technology ever since. Um, we are now uh, serving the majority of our customers in terms of setting this real-time dynamic price uh, at the product level, and increasingly our customers are uh, asking us to allow them to express that market-perfect price, if you will, uh, across a growing number of channels. We focus not on average order value or price for our customers when we're thinking about price optimization. Um, and we don't think about long-term planning cycles when we think about price optimization. We think about maximizing gross margin dollars, um, that uh, product of unit volume times gross margin at the SKU level when we're setting a real-time price. And we're setting the price in the context of that margin target and also the, the, the uh, instantaneous competitive landscape that we're monitoring um, when we make the decision to price a product uh, at a particular price point. Uh, two quick case studies of, of two anonymized customers here. Um, and what, what's really <coughs> critical is that um, the green line, which is percentage gross margin, uh, may drop slightly when we launch uh, a new client on a dynamic pricing uh, account. The gross margin dollars, gross profit dollars, as well as top line revenue both go up. So you often hear retailers uh, and uh, pundits in the e-commerce industry talking about the race to the bottom uh, when you're talking about price optimization. But the reality is, is that what we've seen here and with the next slide um, is that there are real, these are accretive uh, techniques that retailers can apply in cases where they are selling substitutable or identical products against others. Uh, online and on, on phones and ultimately in, in brick and mortar stores. So the news has been really interesting this holiday. I think we are at this tipping point where, you know, I thought the headline here was really intriguing because it wasn't the Best Buy will be matching prices. It's, it was sufficient that they may be matching prices um, that made this newsworthy with uh, Bloomberg. If you hit the next one, uh, Target followed suit. Uh, and then most recently, now, PayPal has come out, and in a really interesting twist, um, we see that the, the payment uh, platforms and wallet providers are realizing that one of the ways that they can add value in the marketplace is by acting as a guarantor of low pricing. Um, and this is really a logical step when you think about the role that Visa and MasterCard and Amazon with their A to Z guarantee um, and the other major e-commerce providers providing that guarantee. You know, it's, it's a logical extension of the brand value of these, of these uh, payments platforms. So, we talk about this concept of a showroomer, which is every single person in this room armed with a smartphone in a physical store. Um, and, you know, expectations have changed. I think uh, if we took a poll in here, uh, I won't do it because we're short on time, but uh, I would expect most of you are uh, monitoring Groupon goods, you're members of private sale programs uh, like Rue La and Gilt, uh, Hope Look Closer to Home here, uh, which is now part of the Nordstrom uh, family of uh, businesses, uh, Zulily here in town, which is also a private sale site. Um, we know mobile units are exceeding uh, desktops and laptops at this point. But one thing that's really important to remember in all of this is that Consumers have limited patience with a poor user experience. And I think one of the things that we're going to discover as we uh, get through this holiday season is that consumers are not willing to stand in line behind someone that has a printout or a, or a tablet with an Amazon price um, haggling with a cashier, um, you know, delaying the entire purchase process in a physical store. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for innovation, particularly for companies that um, rely on uh, physical stores and physical sales uh, around how you optimize uh, that in-store experience for uh, a consumer armed with perfect information. A couple of quick screenshots just to show you kind of how uh, the software actually works. So this is a particular product SKU. It's a Columbia's uh, men's fleece. Uh, and you can see here that on an intra-hour basis, you know, we're modifying the price here in this case by uh, six dollars or you know roughly 15 20 percent uh, and then popping it right back up again as the competitive landscape for that particular skew changes almost done here 
uh, a set of, of merchant-specific um, business rules within the software. And so final thoughts here, guys, on, on implications for retailers and, and for the industry. Um, you know, in some ways, the faster pricing uh, optimization becomes and the more dynamic merchandising offers become and the more comfortable consumers are uh, with the rate that the data is changing, uh, you know, the fundamentals remain. You need to focus on your value proposition in terms of your products and your service. There's plenty of room for uh, innovation. You need to differentiate your in-store experience if you're, if you're managing physical stores. Uh, we've seen kind of this split strategy. You know, you're either embracing the show rumor or you're attempting to block them. Um, and if technology is being applied in both directions. You know, QR codes and shop kick points, uh, on the one hand, reward loyalty uh, or serve offers to those in-store shoppers. On the other hand, you know, you can actually provide your shopper with Wi-Fi to make it easier for them to price compare um, so that you are training them to come to your storefront um, and training them that you, are, that you will be price competitive. Ultimately, we view um, the, uh, the ideal strategy for competing against commoditization uh, and dynamic pricing uh, in, in product innovation and product differentiation. And at a tactical level, that can mean uh, creating unique product SKUs uh, on a per-retail, per-channel basis. Um, but I think ultimately, more strategically, it means focusing on unique or curated uh, product selection. We saw recently that Target and Neiman Marcus have uh, teamed up to create unique product lines. Um, and also we've seen value chain consolidation that ultimately it uh, seems to us at Mercent that um, retailers that own private label product and source it um, all the way from the point of manufacturing to uh, the point of purchase are those that are well positioned to win in the marketplace. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.